In this video, I'm gonna talk about how emotions cause physical pain, and I'm gonna dig into the neuroscience behind stress and anxiety to explain how that happens. Make sure you stay tuned until the end because I'm gonna share with you a few of the tools that I use for myself and for my clients to clear and release stress and anxiety from your body. These are probably gonna be a little bit backwards to what you're used to hearing about. So stick around for that. Hey, beautiful humans, I'm Stuki Baxter, founder of Whole Body Revolution, where I help you to rewire yourself for greater health, happiness, and success by breaking the pattern of pain, stress, and tension in your body and in your life. If you're new here, make sure you click that subscribe button and hit the bell to get notified every time I release a new video. And anything that I mention in this video, you can find linked in the description box below. Let's get into it. So can stress and anxiety, can emotions cause physical pain? Obviously, there's a lot of writing, speaking, people talking about stress management and how bad stress can be for you and for your health. We have a lot of data on that. We have a lot of data about how stress shortens your lifespan, adds belly fat, does all kinds of things. It even unravels your DNA. But if you watch my last video from last week about polyvagal theory, you'll start to understand that stress actually is a lot more nuanced in the way that it gets processed in your body than was previously believed and was kind of the common rhetoric. So what actually even is stress? Let's talk about that for a second. So a lot of times when people are talking about stress, they're talking about the things that are going on in your life, the things that are happening to you. They are talking about the stress ors, the things that actually trigger you into a stress state. So these are things like traffic, a stressful job that has a lot of pressure behind it, uh, relationship issues, grief and loss, things like that that are Emotional, emotionally charged events or emotionally charged circumstances and situations in your life. Now, I'm definitely not gonna deny that these situations have an emotional impact and that's actually what should happen. When you are in a stressed state, when there is something that is required of you, your body is actually supposed to gear up and deal with that. That's why we have a stress response. If we didn't have a stress response, then humans back in the day would have gotten eaten by all the saber-toothed tigers because they wouldn't have run away when the tiger tried to attack and there'd be none of us here today. But really I wanna talk about stress from a slightly different lens because stress actually isn't what's happening to you. Those are the triggers for stress. Stress is what's happening in your body and in your nervous system. Now, like I said, it's totally normal and natural to become stressed when things around you have pressure and are applying pressure to you in uh, either a physical, like a physical threat or a psychological or an emotional threat sort of way. You're supposed to. But where we run into trouble is when these stress responses are prolonged and they get frozen in our body and we cannot discharge the stress. In a natural stress response, what happens is that there is some sort of stimulation. Your body goes into whatever protective mechanism, whether that's a mobilization response. Again, I talked about the mobilization and immobilization responses last week in my video on polyvagal theory. So check that out. I'll link, it to, I'll link to it in the description box below. Uh, so you might mobilize to deal with stress or you might immobilize to deal with stress. But either way, generally speaking, the stress is supposed to pass and then you come back to that regulated state where things are copacetic, things are kind of even keel, you have a sense of safety, et cetera, et cetera. And where we run into trouble is when that doesn't happen. We never return to that sense of safety. So I really wanna talk about stress from the lens of it being the dysregulation in your nervous system rather than all the extraneous stuff that's going on in your life. So let's quickly touch on the role of safety in stress. So I once was having a conversation with a woman who was telling me that she thought she should be more grounded, that she, I believe she was a teacher and she would get in front of her class and she would get really, really excited and her energy would get up and she would get really, really like energized. And she said, and I'm just, I'm not being grounded. And I think this is a huge misconception when it comes to centering, grounding, stress management, that we should always be like tranquil and calm and like moving really chill and slow. That's actually not quite accurate. When you're in that ventral vagal social engagement state that I talked about last week, 
So when you're in a regulated state, i.e. you feel safe, you are connected, you are present with yourself, you're present with other people, you are living in your current environment, not kind of frozen in some past circumstance or stuck in some sort of neural stress trauma loop, you have safety. And in the, from that place, you can energize and it's, it's fun. You get access to joy and playfulness and you can play games and you can have friendly competition. You can even have quite serious competition. I think this is one of the things that really high level athletes are able to access. They're at the top of their game, but they're within their resources. And so they're not completely losing it. They're not rupturing their boundaries and kind of decompensating. They're able to handle that level of stress and they, it feels energizing and it feels like it pushes them. So safety is actually imperative to having a healthy regulated nervous system response. So stress with safety results in all of that joy, friendly competition, even serious competition. It, it results in growth. It results in pushing yourself a little bit. It's exciting. It's, it's activating. And this is what this woman was experiencing. She would get in front of her class and there was all this energy, but there was also safety. She wasn't in a, a stress state that was negative. Now what happens when we have stress without safety, when we feel like we don't have that biological foundation of connection, trust, security, belonging. Belonging is really key. Actually, we talk a lot about the need for food, shelter, water, but really as humans, none of that really matters if we don't have belonging because that's how we get those things. We connect to our our group, our, our people, our caregivers, our communities, our culture in so many different ways. And we get that, uh, that safety from them. We get recognition or, or dignity from them. And we get that, that connection that is essential for our survival. So when we don't have that sense of safety, and I'm not talking about mental safety, I'm not talking about the story you're telling yourself in your spoken word type thoughts in language, I'm talking about your nervous system feels insecure, unsafe, then we have things like panic attacks, anxiety attacks, depression, lethargy, chronic pain, chronic illness, things like that. So a lot of times this gets grouped into this idea of good stress and bad stress. Again, it's not about the thing. It's not about how things are shaped outside of you. It's more about your nervous system's ability to, to deal with them and to dispatch that charge at the end of that threat, to be able to mobilize or immobilize or do whatever it needs to do and then come out of that state and return to a regulated place. So how does stress cause physical pain and other chronic health conditions? When you are in a stress state, a survival state, when your nervous system is not in that regulated state and it's kind of stuck in that loop, unable to discharge the stress that's stored in your nerves, what happens is that it sensitizes your body and your brain to sensory input. So your brain gets data a lot louder and it all seems a lot more threatening. So when you're in those threat states, the whole world actually looks dangerous because you don't have, like I said, that biological basis of safety in your body. So it's important to understand that pain is a sensation generated by your brain. And I talk about this a lot. It's not the same as saying that it's all in your head or it's made up or it's an imaginary sensation, but what it is, is actually an interpretation by your brain of the sensory data that's being sent from your body. Now, if the pathways that are sending that data are distorted, they're amplifying the sensory input because you are in this biological dysregulation state, then your brain's gonna get some mixed signals. It's gonna seem like things that aren't actually problematic are problematic and that's where you start to get these chronic pain conditions that aren't related to something that is treatable by surgery for example it's not something that is structural it's not something that is usually diagnosed by conventional medical science now there's lots of things that medicine can diagnose that are actual real causes of pain which is why it's always a really good idea to have it checked out by a doctor before you start going down this rabbit hole, make sure there's nothing that actually needs medical attention. But so, so often the people that I'm working with get to me because they've already been through all the conventional routes and they're kind of given a, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what happened? They're like, we can't find a cause of your pain. You know, your injury is healed. Um, there was no injury to begin with. Your injury was mild. That's a really common one. Your injury was super mild. Uh, you know, we don't know why you're, 
being this way. And, and then it's often very frustrating for people because they feel like they are somehow going crazy or having histrionics and they're like, but I feel sane, you know, and then they start to believe that maybe they're, they're not. Uh, so I want to be really clear that it's not that the pain is in your head imaginary, it's that the signaling pathways are distorted and you're getting some not so great data that then is turning up as pain. So what we need to do then is bring your nervous system back into that regulated state so that the data you're getting is actually accurate. Is this making sense to you? Can you totally relate to carrying stress in your shoulders and your back and your neck? If so, comment stress below so I know you're still with me. So a lot of medical practitioners, doctors, therapists, what have you, really want to focus in on what happened to you, the story behind your dysregulation, your stress, your pain. I think it's so much more important to talk about what your body is actually saying. And why? Because trauma isn't really about what happened to you for all the reasons I just talked about. You can actually learn trauma. You can inherit trauma. It's not necessarily a momentary event, a single thing that happened. Really what trauma is, I mean, those things are important, but what trauma really is and the way that we can heal it is understanding the effect that it has in your body and in your nervous system. And these processes are operating below your ability to communicate with them with words and language. This is why I center my work around body-based practices that release so stored stress from your muscles. There's a direct connection between the tension that you have in your muscles and the mental tension that you have inside your head. But while we tend to think that it's all mind over matter, the opposite is actually also true. Your body sends more signals to your brain than your brain actually does to your body. You have more sensory nerve fibers running upward, sending data upward into your head than you do communicating from your brain down into your body. Body states actually influence mental states. So for example, people who've had a lot of Botox that immobilizes their facial muscles have difficulty feeling strong emotions, which is why Botox is a treatment that's sometimes used in cases of treatment resistant depression because it can relax the facial muscles that have sort of learned and memorized and habitualized the expression of depression. We kind of know this. You probably have heard that smiling when you're having a bad day can actually lift your mood. Well, the state, the position, the tension of your body, what's going on at that level influences what's happening mentally and emotionally just as much as changing your thoughts can start to influence body states. So thus anxiety states can cause physical pain, but it's not necessarily your anxious thoughts that are the problem, but ra rather the stored stress, the stored anxiety, that sympathetic activation that's frozen in your nervous system that your body has been unable to fully discharge. So how do we break up these patterns? Well, that's actually just it. We have to break up the pattern of tension and the pattern of movement that is happening inside of your body. So under fMRI imaging, functional MRIs, when they look at your brain, what scientists have discovered is that your cerebellum, which is your center of balance and coordination, fires concurrently with the activity in executive function, which is your rational reasoning, decision-making skills, part of your brain. Okay. So why is that important? So balance, coordination, movement, executive function. Your cerebellum, one of its biggest roles is to actually habitualize movement patterns. This is why you can do things without thinking about them. You don't have to Think about how you're gonna walk across the room. You don't have to, from a seated standpoint, think, okay, I'm gonna contract my right quad 30% and then I'm going to shift my, you know, like if you had to do that, you would never get out of bed in the morning, right? We learn these movement patterns and then they are habitualized. We watch babies do this all the time. When a child first learns to eat, they're so awkward with their spoon or their fork and the food goes everywhere, but now you can like play a game on your phone, watch a movie and, you know, pet your cat and eat all at the same time, probably drive too, but you probably shouldn't. So basically your cerebellum is making these patterns habit, things you do without thinking. 
But why that's important is that if your cerebellum, your movement patterns are firing at the same time as executive thought, you've probably heard that neurons that fire together, wire together. What does that mean? When you move a certain way, it actually stimulates a certain kind of thought. We think it's the other way around. We think that you have a thought and then that produces an action or a body state or something like that. That can happen. Humans are capable of that, whereas other animals probably aren't because they don't have the capacity for language in the way that humans do. And I don't really know if there's any studies around that. I know that humans can do that, but for all of us, the state our body is in, the movement patterns we have, the tension patterns that we have, these are neural states. And by breaking up those movement patterns, by breaking up those tension patterns, we can sort of reset our thought patterns. We can start to change and rewire our brain from a very biological, physiological standpoint. Okay, so what are the tools for this? Well, they're actually really simple, but, then the first tool is something called novel sensory input. That is stimulating your body in a new way. That's all it really means is feeling things that you haven't felt before because your body is in this habitual pattern of feeling and sensing. And so we break that loop by giving it new sensory data. That's how we start to create a felt sense of safety. And the other piece of this is movement patterns with attention. So most people, when they're moving, they're not really sensing what they are feeling. Remember how I said you have more sensory fibers sending information to your brain? Well, a lot of people, when they do a movement, it's from a very disembodied, disconnected way where it's almost like like the arm is over here. Notice I even say the arm, right? We even talk about our bodies like it's something that doesn't belong to us. Like the, people come in all the time, the neck hurts. I'm like my, my neck, me, it's part of me. We're so dissociated from our bodies. So movement with awareness, with sensory awareness. So this is called neuroception, right? So you have perception, which is probably what you're used to navigating the world with, which is what you, consciously see and perceive and notice on a regular basis and, and have conscious thought around. And then neuroception, neuroception is what's going on at your body level. So we can start to make uh, that conscious by paying attention to the sensations that we feel through very intentional movement processes. So these tools are actually really simple but they're quite novel. So if you're learning them for the first time, they may seem a little unfamiliar and oftentimes they seem almost too basic, but they are incredibly powerful because like I said, they talk to that part of you that is primitive, primal, basic, uh, at a really deep cellular level, the part of you that you cannot access through rational thought and language and reasoning. If you want to dive into this further, definitely hit me up uh, over at the Pain Free at Any Age video series. It's a totally free series that I put together that I talk more about the neurology of pain and these stress states, and I give you some tools and some movement practices to start you on this journey. So head on over there. You can click the link on your screen or in the description box below. If you found this video helpful, click like, let me know. Definitely remember to subscribe before you leave and hit the bell to get notified every time a new video comes out because you don't want to miss out. And thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you and I will see you in the next one.